one. Thank you, Peter. What's happening? No, that one. Yeah. Oh, no. That's the one. That's the one. Yep, there it is. Right. But right it's on. very dark. It's too dark, isn't it? <laughs> Lighting control. It's a little. I mean, you can see the screen really well, but um. How's that? Oh, oh, that's good. That's good, right? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, um, Peter, and thank you for um, for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm uh, very honored to be here. Thank you all for coming in the late afternoon. Um, I'm super excited to give this talk here um, about something um, that we've been studying for uh, quite some time to understand entropy. Some time ago, about 12 years ago, I realized that I did not understand entropy at all, even though I had gone most of my life thinking that I had. And, um, and so we've, we've found some interesting things, and that's what I want to uh, talk to you about today. Um, but before talking about entropy, <clears throat> let's start with just thinking about matter in, generally, in, in general. Matter is comprised of elements and combinations of elements that mix and match in multiple different ways to produce structure uh, that, and, and behaviors that range from really simple to extraordinarily complex, from, uh, you know, from the salt crystal to the, to the human brain. Um, and as we know, physical matter is held together by chemical bonds. Um, chemical bonds result from the exchange or sharing of electrons between atoms. We can explain chemical bonds with quantum theory and by the wave-like nature um, of the electron. And there's many different examples of chemical bonds. These are just a few of the most uh, commonly discussed ones. Um, but thermodynamics also is important in what kinds of, of structures and behaviors that we get from uh, materials. Thermodynamics is what drives states of matter towards minimum free energy, towards equilibrium. So free energy minimization, thermodynamics, is why water molecules were rearranged from a, from a amorphous liquid structure to form ice in your freezer, why proteins will fold, um, and determines all of the equilibrium structures uh, that, that we find in nature. But it's a, quantum it's a combination of quantum theory and statistical thermodynamics um, that determines all the possible equilibrium structures in nature. So in principle, if we knew all of the interatomic forces between all of the various atomic elements, um, and we could, we could minimize the forces subject to appropriate thermodynamic constraints, we could predict all of the possible stable crystal structures. Um, and those crystal structures can be very complex because of the way that quantum mechanics and thermodynamics will conspire. And so you could have very, very simple uh, unit cells like these up here, uh, where unit cell is just a repeat unit of, uh, of a crystal, right? So you, you just find a pattern in the crystal and you repeat it. That's, the, that's uh, basically the unit cell. You could have really simple unit cells or you could have very, very complicated unit cells where, where you can have hundreds and even um, thousands of atoms in, uh, in intermetallics that can form the one repeat unit. In your, in your crystal. And so I'm very deeply interested to understand why do these structures form? Why, when, what you, why do you get one structure versus another structure? Why would a bunch of atomic elements uh, crystallize into something so complicated when, in principle, it could for, form something much simpler? Um, among the greatest advances of the 20th uh, century is, is the, is the ability to um, have predictive theories of atomic crystal structure uh, based on uh, electronic structure or the development of electronic structure methods uh, of which uh, Professor Panellini's here um, is among the world's experts. Um, and in these electronic structure methods, basically we solve what's known as Schrodinger's equation, um, which, is, uh, which you could solve using simple uh, iterative matrix methods um, basically by, you, you, so let's say you have some element and you want to know what, how do these atoms want to arrange in their ground state? What's their preferred crystal structure? Um, and so you can set them up and then you can describe each atom by uh, 
uh, by a nucleus surrounded by an electron cloud. And if you can uh, uh, write the, you know, the um, sort of the, the wave function of the whole crystal in terms of linear superpositions of, uh, of the orbitals that we use to describe these uh, electronic, um, electron clouds, um, and then solve this iteratively, we can, we, can, we can try different crystal lattices and find the one that has the lowest energy, and that's the one that's thermodynamically preferred. Um, these computations can get very costly, um, and that computational cost increases with the number of atoms and the size of the unit cell. Um, and of course, there's lots of different approximations that have to be made to solve Schrodinger's equation. Um, but in principle, the chemical bonding structure of any set of n atoms can be computed with varying degrees of accuracy depending on, on what um, combinations that, that, we, that we use. So I don't work on any of that. My group works in soft matter. In soft matter, our building blocks are not atoms. They're made of atoms, of course, but they're much bigger. They're on the size scale of one to, say, a thousand nanometers. Um, they're things like proteins and DNA and virus shells. Um, my cells that are made of, of uh, little lipid, lipid molecules, uh, liposomes, dendrimers, which are kind of fractal little polymer uh, molecules, um, <laughs> nanoparticles like little, little gold nanoparticles and quantum dots, um, and, and particles that can be, um, that can be made of literally uh, any kind of metal, uh, uh, rare earths, different semiconductor materials um, that can be now made into virtually any shape and decorated with ligands that can be small molecules, they can, they can be um, longer, uh, longer uh, ligands, they can be DNA, oligonucleotides, proteins, et cetera, et cetera. So it's possible now to make these building blocks that are, that are much larger than individual atoms and are not constrained uh, by uh, the discreteness of electronic structure and you can get all kinds of different, create different kinds of local valence by making these, these, bit, these larger building blocks on this scale. So the problem of course is that our, our atoms are big and they're complex so we, we don't have anything like a Schrodinger's equation to tell us what structures that they want to form. Also um, these are governed by the rules of statistical thermodynamics. We're typically interested in um, a solution of these nanoparticles. They might be suspended in water or some kind of inorganic solvent. And we want to change the thermodynamic conditions by changing the temperature or the pH of the solution um, and, uh, and observe these, these uh, building blocks forming some kind of a crystal structure. And so in that, temperature and entropy are important. Um, What's fascinating to me is that there are now scores of 3D crystal structures that have been self-assembled in solution from the soft matter building blocks that are isostructural to atomic crystals, many, many types of atomic crystals. So here's just a few uh, as, an, as an example. Um, these are from the group of uh, Dimitri Talapin where they have little, they have mixtures of uh, spherical gold nanoparticles um, these are probably, what's the, what's the, I'm trying to find the scale bar here. These are probably about 20 nanometers in, in, in diameter. And they have uh, two uh, types of particles, spheres of two different, with two different radii. And the way that they mix together and crystallize in solution will form these different kinds of crystal structures. So here's, here's, an, uh, uh, here's, here's one, here's copper gold, here's uh, ALB2. Um, there's all these different kinds of crystal structures just by changing the ratio of the sizes of these, of these spheres. Um, this is an example from uh, Frank Bates' group of Minnesota. These are polymers, tri-block copolymers, so it's a long chain molecule where, uh, where you have three different blocks, meaning that there are three different, uh, three different sets of monomers that make this up, but they're covalently bonded together. And so they'll self-assemble into really interesting structures. Here, his tri-block copolymer self-assembled into micelles. And each one of these bright dots is one of those micelles. 
So each one of these, these bright dots might have hundreds or thousands of polymers in it, and then those micelles form uh, this really interesting crystal structure here that happens to be something called the sigma phase, which is one of the Archimedean tilings. Um, this is a, a cool structure that's made from silver nanoparticles that was made by Peidang Yang's group at Berkeley uh, about a decade ago, where all of these are little silver particles that are grown in solution and form little octahedra. And um, they're colored just so you can kind of see the structure. But what they do is they, these particles they found self-assemble into uh, a, a crystal structure that's isostructural to high pressure lithium. So if you took lithium as a crystal and put it under high pressure, that's the crystal structure you would get. There's 16 particles in the unit cell. And it's a, com it's a complex, um, complex unit cell. And here they're formed simply by these, uh, these silver, um, silver octahedral particles. Um, you can even substitute some of these gold particles with viruses, um, and they will form some of these same crystal structures. Um, these are examples of using uh, DNA linked to nanoparticles to make the nanoparticles come together in a way that they never would do without the DNA. The idea is that they have a particle, they functionalize it with DNA all over, they put complementary sticky ends, and then when they, when they mix them together, the complementary sticky ends find each other, pulling the, say, gold nanoparticles into some arrangement that they might not ordinarily want to do at all in water. And, um, and you could get these kinds of, same kinds of crystal structures. And so now there's been uh, scores and scores of crystal structures that have been published by groups like Chad Merkins at Northwestern, or Ole Gangs uh, at, uh, at Col uh, Columbia and, uh, and Brookhaven National Lab where all of these are examples of these crystal structures that are held together by, by DNA. And there's many, many other examples like this. But in every case, it's the inner particle interactions that are mediated by the solvent and combined with thermodynamics that dictate these crystal morphologies. Of course, quantum mechanics is there, but we don't have to think about quantum mechanics to understand how these things are forming crystal structures, even though the crystal structures are identical in many cases to the crystal structures that we find for atomic crystals, but of course with larger lattice spacing. So here's an example. This is a beautiful image from uh, Chad Merkin's group um, with uh, the, you know, the, the color just to make it look pretty. Um, these are, these are <coughs> crystals made of gold nanoparticles. <coughs> so every single tiny, tiny dot, like the smallest feature you can see, <coughs> is, a, is, a, is a gold nanoparticle that's about 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers in diameter. Um, they form this crystal because they were functionalized by DNA. And the crystals are so nice and such good quality that they could grow out and form this wool shape. So here, these crystals are forming a, thank you, face center cubic crystal structure. Thanks. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and the wool shape of a face center cubic crystal structure is this rhombic dodecahedra. And so this just shows you how beautiful these and, and regular these crystals can, can grow. Um, so this is a what we call a colloidal crystal of gold nanoparticles. Each one of these little things is, is, uh, is, is one of the gold nanoparticles. They're arranged in, a, in an FCC crystal. Um, if, <clears throat> if we were to look at every one of these particles, really the gold particle is here made of uh, gold atoms, um, and the whole particle is functionalized by these sticky end DNA um, uh, oligomers. And then if you look inside of the gold nanoparticle that's made of gold atoms, they themselves are arranged in a face center cubic crystal. So you have this beautiful hierarchy of scales um, in, these, in these kinds of uh, colloidal crystals. So here's an example of the, or, or here is the most complex crystal structure that's re been reported in the literature to date to be made from nanoparticles. Um, this is, uh, a, a, these are little gold uh, bipyramids. So, so say you take a two tetrahedra, and you stick them together, and you squash it a little bit. That's what these particles look like. So those are the particles that his uh, student, Ha Xin Lin, made and functionalize them with DNA. So they have this anchor strand, and they have this duplexer strand of DNA, 
And then this is the little sticky end that's going to find a self-complementary sticky end and hold these nanotetrahedra together. And then somehow all of the tetrahedra figure out globally what to do to find the minimum free energy structure in, in the solution. And this is the crystal structure that you see. This is a five micron scale bar. Um, these, this, is the, this is a 250 nanometer on an edge particle. So you see how large this crystal is. And here's an even larger chunk um, of this crystal. So this, is, this crystal structure has 123 particles in the unit cell, 123 particles. And then it repeats itself, which I would call a pretty complex crystal structure. <clears throat> so in my group, we make absolutely nothing. But we simulate things. Our goal, our job, is to come up with, uh, with accurate, accurate models uh, and solve these models using computer simulation and try to predict what crystal structures will form from what kinds of nanoparticles or what kinds of nanoparticles should you make if you want to get a particular kind of crystal structure. And also to help understand why did Chad Merkin's uh, group, when they throw these, these different shapes in, all of a sudden get a 123 particle clef colloidal clathrate crystal uh, with 123 particles in the unit cell. And, uh, and it's a challenging problem for simulators only because there's so many different forces going on, um, many of which we have very little information about. So this is a, a, a nice uh, table that was put together by um, uh, a collaborator of mine, Chris Murray, at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania, um, where we listed all the different kinds of, uh, or flavors of nanoparticles and all the different kinds of materials that just the bare nanoparticle can be made of, plus all the different kinds of ligands um, that, that uh, researchers like, like him and, and, and many others will use to decorate these nanoparticles and confer additional types of interactions to them. Um, all of the different, you know, dendromers, oligomers, uh, pol polymers, uh, long chain branched uh, different polymers. Um, and so from a simulation point of view, we have to think about, so what are all the different forces in the system? And how are they conspiring together to give some complex crystal structure? So we have to think about van der Waals interactions between, for example, gold particles and water. Um, there, are, there could be Coulomb interactions because these particles can be charged, the ligands can be charged, there could be magnetic uh, forces. Uh, hydrophobicity could be important. Many of these nanoparticles are self-assembled in, in water. Uh, many times these ligands hydrogen bond with each other, so that's also we have to think about. And then of course there's the excluded volume, just the hardcore part of the interaction that is, um, that arises just from the fact that you have a particle and it's not an atom, it has a shape. So it takes up some, takes up some volume. Um, and so somehow, based on the system, all of these different forces are what's conspiring to give you these different kinds of crystal structures. And so we started studying these kinds of problems back in, in the early two, 2000s um, when my colleague Nick Kotoff moved um, to Michigan. And, uh, and he, so, so one thing that we learned, uh, so as simulators, we work with a lot of different experimental groups. Every experimental group has their pet nanoparticles. Everybody makes like this nanoparticle or that type, and these guys will never make that type. These guys will never make that type. And so uh, Nick makes uh, little cat telluride nanoparticles. They're cat telluride, cat selenide, cat sulfide. They're one, one and a half roughly nanometers on an edge, so very, very, very small nanoparticles. Um, he grows them in water, which is why they're again growing into these little crystals and growing, therefore growing into these shapes. And then he can functionalize them with different types of organic ligands. And, uh, and so we published a bunch of papers with his group because he found that uh, when he changed the type of ligand from one thing to another, even though the nanoparticles were identical, he would get very different kinds of structures. So he might get these, these nano sheets. So these little tetrahedrally shaped nanoparticles, or one and a half nanometer on an edge, would self-assemble into what looked like a monolayer uh, sheet. And this is, a, this is the sheet. This is a two micron scale bar. So this is, this is enormous relative to the size of the nanoparticle. And then when he changed the the, the ligand from uh, DMAT to TGA, all of a sudden they made these wires. And then when his student did the, did, did the experiments um, under different lighting conditions, <laughs> instead of getting either one of these, they got a ribbon, something in between a big sheet 
and a skinny long wire. So they form these ribbons and then the ribbons twist and that's what one of these long twisted ribbons look like and then all the twisted ribbons of a particular chirality would bundle together into these things. Um, here's an example where uh, his student, so one of the things that you've, you have to learn, where are the graduate students? Where are you? Graduate students? Okay, awesome. So you know how sometimes you listen to your advisor and sometimes like you just don't. Um, sometimes they give you really good suggestions, sometimes they give you suggestions that you know you're not going to follow. So, but you have to, the, the trick is you have to learn like which are the right ones and which are the wrong ones, right? So here, um, Nick had a student, uh, uh, Shah, who um, made a bunch of these nanoparticles, but instead of using their typical protocol to grow these nanoparticles in water um, and, and end up with a, with a size distribution that had a variance of only like 3%, so really tight um, uh, you know, di size distribution of particles. He used a different protocol and then ended up with 25% poly size polydispersity, right? Which, you know, Nick said, so you have all these particles of all these different sizes. What are they ever going to form? Why would they form any kind of interesting crystal structure, throw them out, make another one? But this was when he chose not to listen to Nick. And instead, he, he went ahead and, and set up the experiment and they ended up these particles ended up forming these big supra particles, like a ball full of these little nanoparticles. So each one of these little spheres is densely packed with these little nanoparticles. Each one ends up with about 300 nanoparticles in it. And then once it grew to a certain size, it stopped. And that was done, like, like a ter self-terminating assembled structure. And then those supra particles, those, those spheres are so perfect that they themselves self-assembled into a face-centered cubic colloidal crystal structure. And it turned out that, that the polydispersity was a key reason why, uh, how you were able to get a balance of forces that, that, that gives you all this. So we started studying all this. And at some point, um, I said to my student, Amir Haji Akbari Balu, who is now assistant professor in chemical engineering at Yale, I said, okay, I don't understand <clears throat> how all these different, so, so we came up with a model, one model, that if we just change the parameters, like the, the strength of the Van der Waals interaction versus the Coulomb inter interaction, if we thought there was a dipole interaction or not a dipole interaction, and we, and we parameterize those different terms, the different contributions to all the forces um, by whatever experimental measurements we could get from, from Nick's group, we were able to, with one model, predict all of these different um, kinds of structures under the right circumstances. But it still didn't tell us how they're conspiring. So I said, okay, Amir, turn off all the forces. Let's turn them off. Let's just start with these hard, uh, hard tetrahedra in a simulation box. We're doing Monte Carlo simulations, which means you grab a particle and you randomly try to rotate it or translate it to a new position in the box. And if it lowers the energy of the system, then you do it. And if it doesn't, you do it with some probability. But if there's no interaction energy, then you know, you, it, all you have to worry about is I can't overlap. So I just randomly rotate, translate. So this is a statistical method of sampling phase space, whereas say molecular dynamics where you're solving Newton's equation, F equals MA over and over, is a deterministic exploration of phase space, meaning of all the different possible arrangements of the particles in the, in the system. So I said, turn, it, turn them all off, and then let's start turning on the forces one by one so we could see which ones do, you know, what are, how, how, what are the contributions of each of these forces. So he comes to me, he shows me this movie, and uh, he says, ah, something's going on in this box of tetrahedra. And I said, well, yeah, it's ordering into something. I thought you were going to turn off all the forces. He said, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Um, so it turns out that, yes, he did. And out of this came this structure. And we couldn't tell what it was. Um, back then, we, we didn't have the, the kind of sophisticated um, computational crystallography tools that a postdoc named Michael Engel brought to my group. Um, and so the only way I said, okay, just make them all see-through and color them, and then if we, well, we should be able to see like some kind of pattern that way. And this is the pattern that I call the stained glass picture. This ended up being the BBC News Image of the Week, uh, the week of, of December 4th um, of 2009, December 14th. So 
I don't know if you get these BBC News image of the week. It's usually like like a big little like a special baby bird or like a village. Okay. Well, this time it was this it was this picture, and it turned out that what Amir had obtained purely by serendipity is a dodecagonal quasi crystal, which is a crystal structure that doesn't have a repeat unit, but there's still order. There's long range orientational order, not long range translational order. And it's a really cool structure. Um, it's complicated. So what happens is the particles, um, they form these five particle rings and then a 12, 12 particle ring and then a five particle like pentagonal dipyramid, then a ring, then a dipyramid, then a ring. And, and that's what these, they form these logs. And if you slice it this way and you look down, that's what this picture is. That's the 12 fold axis. And, and, and then you end up with this, this gorgeous pattern. Um, and it turns out that Amir's quasicrystal is isostructural to this quasicrystal, tantalum tellurium quasicrystalline chalcogenide, which was discovered back in 1998. If we take our diffraction path, so in this uh, TEM image, the, each one of these little dots is an, is an atom. And so you're seeing this, the, these resolution. This is the, the diffraction pattern. You can then draw these little tiles to help you figure out what you have, and this is how the atoms are arranged. If we take our uh, diffraction pattern and put it on top of theirs, it matches up peak for peak. So with no tantalum, no tellurium, no quantum mechanics, just little Dungeons and Dragons dice thrown into a box, free to move around, we get the same exact crystal structure. Um, this is how, what it looks like, this is a newer simulation that has many more particles in the box. It is counterintuitive to most people that in the absence of any explicit interactions between particles, that you could go from a disordered structure to an ordered structure. Um, but in fact, you can. Um, and it, the reason that you can is has to do with entropy. Um, still, most people associate entropy with disorder, right? We think something that's disordered has higher entropy than something that's ordered. But in these simulations, I showed you a box of just randomly arranged particles that then ordered into this crystal structure with nothing in the box. So let's go through why, how, how we understand that from entropy. So entropy, as we know, you know, the, our first understanding of entropy came from considering um, energy that was lost, that was lost to heat, that couldn't be recovered and couldn't be reused to do useful work. Um, uh, but then Boltzmann and Gibbs came along uh, in the 1870s, and they were the first to connect the notion of entropy to this concept of phase space or state space. This idea that uh, that you that that you have a certain number of a certain number of microstates or a ways of arranging particles in the system. And that is a, a, a microscopic way of understanding what, what entropy is. And so a microstate is an example. So right now, let's say we were a thermodynamic system, and I took a snapshot of, this, of the room. Then, you're, then this is one way of arranging all the people in the chairs. But if you two switch places, that would be another way of arranging the people in, the square, in, in, in these. If all of you moved up to the front, which is a very low probability event, um, that would be another microstate of the system. So all the different ways that you can arrange all the different people in the chairs are example of all the microstates of the system. Likewise, if you have a bunch of tetrahedra in a box or a bunch of atoms in, 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 in a beaker, whatever, all the different ways that they can arrange is, um, are all the different microstates of the system. So Gibbs said, you know, if we knew the probability of a particular type of microstate, and we took the log of the probability, multiplied by the probability and summed over all of the bazillion possible microstates in the system, then that's what the entropy is. He said entropy is just co counting up microstates um, suitably weighted. All right, so there's an analogy with Shannon entropy. So uh, in information theory, there is also quantum, uh, there's also quantity called entropy, because von Neumann apparently said, oh, you, Shannon, should call this thing entropy and, and confuse everybody. But anyway, this is what the information theory defi definition is. Shannon entropy, as it's called, measures the uncertainty that's associated with a random variable. It's like the amount of information in a, in a message 
measured in, in bits. Um, and so one way to think about the entropy in an information theory context is that it's the minimum number of yes-no questions that you have to ask to fully determine the system. The more questions you have to ask to fully determine a system, the less you know about the system, the higher the entropy of the system, right? Okay. All bank microstates with the same energy are equally likely. We all learned this in kindergarten statistical thermodynamics. But all, but hard particles, there's no energy. There's no potential energy. There's just excluded volume. So that means all the microstates are actually equally likely. So if you happen to have omega different ways of arranging things, the probability of any one of them is just one over the total number of them, right? It's like flipping a coin and you can either have head or tails. There's two possible outcomes and the probability of either of the outcome is just one over the two possible outcomes. It's the same thing. So Bolson said, oh, I'll just take that and I'll put that in the Gibbs entropy formula and out will come this expression, which we call the Boltzmann entropy formula, that says if we know the number of microstates in the system, then that's the entropy, if all the microstates are equally, equally likely. So why, how does this have to do anything with us? Well, in these uh, systems where we have, say, a simulation of fixed number of particles and a fixed volume, that's the, that's the, um, then the, the thermodynamics, the thermodynamic potential that's minimized is called the Helmholtz free energy. Helmholtz free energy is the potential energy minus T times entropy. We have no potential energy in our system. All we have is entropy. So it means that the free energy is just all the number of, basically all the number of ways of rearranging things in the, in the system. So if thermodynamics is all about minimizing free energy, that means that in these cases, it's all about maximizing the entropy because there's a minus sign. So minimizing free energy means maximizing entropy. That means you could have emergence of order because of entropy if there's more ways to be ordered than disorder. And that's exactly the situation. And seriously, we've known this since 1949, but like not everybody knew apparently, and those who did like kept it secret. But um, Onsager in 1949 uh, said, you know, if I took infinitely long rods and I, and I, and infinitely long, infinitely thin, but they can't pass through each other, and I start increasing the density, so crowding them together, they're gonna have to line up. They'll give up rotational degrees of freedom for translational degrees of freedom to access more microstates in the system. That's what that paper's about, and that's what this, um, this simulation showed. So here, when they're red, the, the rods are locally disordered relative to their neighbors, and when they turn green is when there's a local alignment with the neighbors. And so we see the disordered system ordering sitting here at fixed volume. Um, and that's an example of the isotropic pneumatic transition of hard rods, the isotropic pneumatic transition of, li of, of liquid crystalline molecules underlies like, all of our laptop screens, for example. And by lining up, there are more ways to arrange the rods if they're lined up than if you don't line them up. If you don't line them up, they're just gonna get stuck. But by lining them up, you can start pushing them more together because they can, they, can do, they can do this. So it's weird. It's weird to think about. It's counterintuitive. Um, so then Kirkwood came along, like eight years later, uh, a chemist, and said, oh, I bet this is true for spheres. And people said, well, that's absurd. <laughs> spheres only have translational degrees of freedom. What are you talking about? There's no rotational anything. He said, yeah, 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 I know. They're gonna, they're gonna if you crowd them enough, you'll just spontaneously get a face center cubic crystal. Uh, and that's showing you here uh, a fluid, a disordered fluid of hard spheres spontaneously forming a, a crystal, uh, a face center cubic crystal. Um, and this was done by the, the, really the first molecular dynamic simulations that were ever done. They were done in 1958 by Alder and Wainwright and also by, um, by Wood and Jacobson, they had the same, they took the same system and one did Monte Carlo simulations and one did MD simulations and showed that when you get to about 50% packing fraction, so 50% of the box is empty, 50% is occupied by these hard spheres, they spontaneously order into face center cubic crystal. And nobody believed it because it was computer simulation and it was like the 60s, so 
people thought, this is just stupid. We'll never believe computer simulations ever. And, and in fact, they argued about this for a long time until Paul Chaikin and, and Bill Russell flew these experiments. Well, they didn't get to go. But they prepared it and gave it to these astronauts who, who uh, took this experiment up on the space shuttle um, just to really show, like, we really, really eliminate all, all gravity so that you can make these little, like, polymethyl evaporator, polystyrene spheres suspended in toluene and organic fluid and density match them so they're really like little brownian particles that they will crystallize. And those, that's why you see all the different colors in here because it's different crystallites that are reflecting, reflecting the light. And so this crew of the space shuttle is on, is our, our, our co-authors of the Nature paper back in 1997. Um, another way of thinking about this for spheres is that, uh, is that if, you know, if you, so if I, if I had a box and I threw in spheres all the same size, just at random, the densest I could possibly pack them is 62%. But if instead of making them random, I ordered them like you would oranges, like in the market, right? And I, and I put a whole, a whole like, row down, and then another row that staggered a little, and then another row staggered a little to make them pack as close as possible. The densest you can pack is 74.05%, which is pi over the square root of 18. Um, but in between 63% and 74%, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of, 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 of room in there. But the only way you can access them is if you, if you order into, this, into the crystal. So, okay. So entropy can really order stuff. Um, we did this study, I mean, once, so once we saw these tetrahedra doing this, we're like, okay, so is that just the tip of the iceberg or is, like, is this a one-off? And so I had this a very industrious student, Pablo Del Messino, who then did 145 different shapes and did what Amir did, but for 145 different systems, and found that 101 of these different hard shapes crystallize in the, in the computer. Um, some of them into very simple, like all of these shapes into face center cubic crystal, body center cubic crystal, topologically close packed phases like beta, um, uh, beta tungsten, um, and, and beta manganese, uh, gamma brass, with 52 particles in the unit cell from, from these re really weird shapes. Um, you get all these different kinds of crystals, like the quasi-crystal that, that, that we found, and uh, these other kinds of, like, brave lattices. Um, some liquid crystals, and then there were 40, 44 that just never crystallized until, like, we just ran and ran and ran. A couple years ago, one of them crystallized. We'd, like, run it for years. And then it finally figured out, oh, there's a better way, and it crystallized. Um, here's an example. So experimentally, it's really it's hard to, to, to obtain this experimentally. Here's why. So when you have small nanoparticles, uh, so like metal nanoparticles, um, um, you know, the, like gold nanoparticles, semiconductor nanoparticles, rare earths, those are grown in solution, atom by atom. And so you get these little crystallites, and they are polyhedra. They're faceted, so you have these little polyhedra. But when they're small, like 50 nanometers or some 20 nanometers, you can't screen all the interactions away. And so you can't really realize perfectly hard particles at that scale. But up at the you know, 300 nanometer plus scale, um, you, you can in certain circumstances, but then most of the particles are spheres or rods, or ellipsoids, um, because they're, they're made in a very, very different way. They're not grown out of solution, so you don't get these little faceted shapes. Um, and, uh, but here's an example of a, of a recent experiment by Stefano Sakana um, at, at NYU. Um, he made these uh, little uh, poly polymethyl methacrylate particles where he, he made, like, they're little truncated tetrahedra. And they self-assemble into a cubic diamond structure, which is the same structure that we predicted that these truncated tetrahedra would self-assemble into back in, back in 2012. So there's just one, one example. Um, there are several others, and there, there are more coming now, of if you could really, truly screen out all the interactions. This is the most complex crystal structure we, or I should say, this is the largest unit cell we've gotten so far. Um, uh, this is a differently truncated tetrahedra, so you cut the corners and you cut the edges. All the particles are identical. You throw them in a box, da-na-na. It's about 55, 60% packing fraction. 
and, uh, and you see that it starts out, I should say it starts out where everything's a fluid. And so we don't show you the particles, we just show you little blue dots. Once they start organizing locally, we color them orange. And now red is the crystal. And it turns out that this thing has 432 particles in its unit cell. Why would it do that? Um, it does it. Um, this, is a, this is what the unit cell looks like. Uh, this is what its uh, bond order diagram looks like. So if you sit on a particle and you look at where all the neighbors are, and then you project it onto the surface of a unit sphere, then you get like a fingerprint of that particular local environment, and that's what helps us figure out what we have. Um, so this is something that's isostructural to a Bergman-like phase found in metal alloys that was discovered by Linus Pauling a long time ago. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you entropy alone can drive this incredible diversity of colloidal crystal structures. And the whole, the, it is very uh, easy to understand once you buy the fact that hard rods will give up translational degrees of free, rotational degrees of freedom to gain translational degrees of freedom in order to increase the entropy of the system. Here we have shapes. And so the shapes are aligning their biggest facets to avoid getting stuck. And that gives them more ways of arranging themselves. And they can arrange themselves in more microstates that are, that are consistent with a crystal structure, that are consistent with a disordered structure. So it's like Onsaga on steroids. And that's how we understand how all of these shapes are forming what they're forming. It's just complicated when you have lots of facets, and some facets are big, and some are little. So there's all this um, competition. But somehow that competition gives rise to an, a, to an effective valence. Um, sometimes the solution of how entropy solves this problem is really surprising. And we have something called entropic compartments. I don't know what to call it. I call it entropic compartmentalization. Here's, here's a shape. Um, this is, this is what the shape looks like. They're all identical. We're, they're self-assembling. So the box is full of these. You're just not seeing them until they lock into place. Um, this is what locally one of these cages looks like. It's full of these particles. But there's a hole in the middle where one of them is trapped. And so these cages, instead of showing you the particles, we show you just this, this network. So this is a clathrate crystal with 92 particles in the unit cell. Um, and, uh, and so you get this clathrate, so, so clathrates uh, are found, so water can make clathrate crystals. You have some, some ions, they get trapped inside of these, um, these cages. Uh, here, this is like a self-trap, like, a, like a, the coast and guest are the same particle. And what's interesting is all the cage, they're stuck. But all the entropy has been thrown into the particles in the middle, which are spinning around like crazy, right? They have all the entropy in the system, basically. And so the system figured out that that's the best solution. 92 particle unit cell where most of the particles are locked up and a few of them can spin. So I think that's surprising. Um, I mentioned that. Um, Merkin's group found this beautiful colloidal clathrate by taking these triangular bipyramids linked by DNA and, and they self-assemble. So it turns out, and here's the part that, that Chad won't ever tell anybody, is that you don't need the DNA to get that crystal structure. If you just throw the hard shapes, exactly the same shapes, into a box and crowd them, you will get um, exactly the same uh, colloidal crystal to form. and and uh, and it, and it happens to form by first undergoing a liquid, a fluid, fluid phase transition. It separates into two fluids, a low density fluid and a high density fluid. And then it forms this crystal that's the red at the interface between the two fluids. Where it's white is the low density fluid that we're not showing you. And this is just what the network structure looks like. And the reason why you can get this without DNA is, so in the DNA situation, you throw the particles in, you don't have to crowd them. But they're in there, and they'll find each other, and the DNA will glue them together. But instead of the DNA gluing them together, I'm just crowding the hard particles. In the DNA case, the DNA is all over the particle, and the DNA is just bringing facets together. Well, here, the entropy is aligning the facets to, to maximize the entropy. So either way, the system realizes that the best solution to minimize the free energy, even all the forces are different is to align those facets. And that's why we can get the same crystal structures with and without explicit um, interactions. 
So now we're on this quest, this insane quest to find out what crystal structures can't we get with entropy alone. And now I've only showed you one, like mono, one component systems with one shape. What if we mix shapes? We can get all kinds of crystal structures then. Um, if some crystal structures aren't possible with only entropy, why not? What's special about them? Um, and even in these systems where we can't really screen out the interactions, knowing what the entropic contribution could be to nanoparticle assembly, even in the presence of other forces, is important. So when experimentalists come to us, they say, oh, I can make these kinds of nanoparticles. Tell me how I should functionalize them like with attractive ligands so that I'll get something interesting. Like what, how long should the ligands be and how strong, and should we, do we want to pick ones that uh, you know, have, have uh, you know, strong electrostatic interactions with this? No one ever says, help me engineer the entropy so that I can get a certain crystal structure. Um, so I think I'm almost, am I like out of time? I should like, <laughs> this one, okay. Will you stick around for five more minutes? Yeah, yeah? okay. Um, so I, yeah, there's food <laughs> afterwards. Nobody gets food until you sit here, until the last <laughs> slide. So I just wanna show you this. This is one of my favorite movies. This is the shape. That's what it looks like from the side. That's what it looks like from the top. It starts off blue particles. Blue means it's disordered. They form a blue phase and a yellow phase. The yellow phase is, and I'm going to play it again, is the high density amorphous phase. The blue is the low density amorphous phase. So it's two fluids coexisting. And the crystal is, is when we color them green, now it's locally in a crystal. And look at how it's growing in this crazy zigzag way. Like, I, 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 I'm positive that if I just like stopped any one of you in the hallway and I showed you this on my phone and I said, what do you think's going on in there? You'd say, oh, those green particles must be really sticky. They must really wanna be together, right? The fact that this is entropy, entropy driven is just amazing to me. Now, all of us engineers, physicists, chemists, we all know the ideal gas law, right? PV equals NKT or NRT. Ideal gas is when you have particles that can just move through each other. They're ideal. They don't see each other, right? So Van der Waals said, well, the simplest thing that, that you have to do to this equation to support a phase transition is that, first of all, you have to recognize that um, atoms have a uh, size. And so they are actually taking up some space. They're not ideal. So you have to subtract off the excluded volume in the system. And secondly, you have to have an attractive, inter uh, attractive interaction between the particles. If you don't have the attractive interaction, Van der Waals says, you can't have a phase transition. Why is that? If you plot this equation for different temperatures, that's what these so-called Van der Waals isotherms look like. This is high temperature. It has just one curvature. This is low temperature. Below the critical temperature, that's when you get this inflection. And this kind of shape in the pressure versus volume equation of state is what allows at one pressure to have uh, two coexisting phases with different densities. But that thing comes from this squared, one over V squared term. If you don't have the one over V squared, you don't get this. But we don't have any attraction. But I would claim we have this effective attraction that's coming from the statistical emergent entropic forces um, or these entropic bonds. So um, we have ways of measuring in, this, in, our, in our simulations the strength of these entropic bonds under different considerations. And they get stronger and stronger the denser and denser it is. Particles with really, with few large facets are the strongest bonding. Particles that are very roundy with lots and lots of little facets are less strongly bonded. Um, but we can calculate that effective interaction, effective attraction, which is not real, not, not, a, not an explicit one, like we usually think about. And it's small, but it's not inconsequential compared to some other, some other forces. And so <clears throat> I would claim that if we can think of these, these entropic bonds and the way that we think of chemical bonds, even though they're not, then um, maybe entropic bonding is a process that selects for the set of interparticle orientations and positions that maximizes the system entropy. 
And what does that mean? So I would claim that if, if I can take hard shapes, throw them in a box, and get the same crystal structure that you know, someone else can make in the lab with, I don't know, uh, you know copper gold or manganese, whatever, um, then if I, can, if, I can, if I have a Schrodinger equation I can solve to tell me what lattice this wants to be, what am I, what, what's my Schrodinger equation on this side? Well, we don't have one, or we didn't have one, um, but I challenged my postdoc to come up with one, um, and he did. And, uh, and the idea is that we want to be able to, instead of putting, replacing these, you know, here we have atoms, and we replace the atoms with a nucleus surrounded by an electron density cloud that we can write in terms of uh, atomic orbitals, like the s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals. Um, we want to put, put, we want to think about these colloidal crystals with shapes, but replace those shapes with some kind of a probability density cloud, but of what? Um, in other words, we want to take our crowded system of particle shapes and replace it by a system of particles that doesn't have to be crowded and instead has these fictitious electron-like particles that are gluing them together. Um, and so if we can do that, then we, we still need some kind of classical analog of Schrodinger's equation for this. And we have to figure out, well, what are these little pseudoparticles and how do we describe them and how do we calculate all these orbitals? Um, and so this is a longer conversation, but so I just want to mention, because I'm excited about it, um, that it turns out that if you can buy the fact that, okay, I'll take this effective entropic attraction and describe it in terms of these fictitious, just you know, mathematical little pseudoparticles that carry this effective attraction between shapes somehow. And if I write down a diffusion equation for these little pseudoparticles, starting with a Smolachowski diffusion equation, and I do something that Bob Zwanzig did in some paper somewhere uh, where he showed that you, know, you could take the Smolachowski diffusion equation and make itself a joint and therefore make it into an eigenvalue equation, then we end up with an equation that looks like this, where this is the Hamiltonian of the system, this is the energy of the system, this is some kind of wave function, which we don't have because they're not really electrons, but mathematically we can describe things in this way. Um, and then we can calculate using a self-consistent mean field approach, which I don't have time to explain here, but the idea is that we want to we want to represent the crowding due to other shapes. So if I have if I'm a particle and there's another particle here and we're all being crowded by these other shapes, I want to get rid of those shapes but have an effective interaction that's described by these this dense like a, a, a cloud of these little pseudo particles that are describing the entropic interaction, um, and uh, and so. You, you, so you could do that by doing a mean field calculation where you get rid of all these other particles and you just average over their orientations. You don't know what crystal they're going to form. The crystal does not come into the calculation, otherwise you'd be giving your system the answer. Um, and you end up with this, uh, this probability distribution cloud of these mathematically, uh, these fictitious mathematical pseudoparticles that you can expand in terms of spherical harmonic-like orbitals but with the geometry of the shape. And then we could use, then we could go ahead and do like density functional theory on this. We can just solve uh, the same way using the same iterative methods. And I'll just quickly show you that, for example, you can take, uh, you can use these methods and solve for the strength of this effective entropic bond between two cubes and use it to show that, for example, if you have cubes in a box, they will self-assemble into a simple cubic crystal, anything above 50% packing fraction. Um, and so you could set up different crystals, like what if you didn't know that? So you set up a simple cubic, FCC, BCC, anything you want. You put it through that machinery, calculate the free energy, um, and see which one is lowest, and the lowest free energy wins. And so here this shows that the simple cubic crystal will win at this particular density. Um, and the real test for me was when my postdoc T, who did this, work, took the tetrahedra that form into a quasi-crystal, and then looked at what happens if you start with a tetrahedron and then you change the shape, change the shape, change the shape, all the way into it's an octahedron, 
And then you ask, well, what's the, what crystal structure does it want to be? And so you try all these different crystal structures, and you find what's the free energy, and you say, well, well whichever one's lowest wins. So that's the lowest, that's the lowest, that's the lowest. So that's, those are the crystal structures. They're labeled here that win these color bars. Um, and these black lines are what we obtained back in 2012 um, in an ACS nano paper where we just did Monte Carlo simulations of these different shapes in a box. And so we find that his calculations, these predictive calculations, which involve no simulation at all, they're literally like an electronic structure theory calculation, um, match up pretty well with these predictions from the paper. So really excited about that. Um, these are the takeaways uh, that perhaps maybe we have a microscopic, predictive microscopic theory of entropic bonding, at least for colloidal crystals. Um, and it's possible now to, of course, go back and put in explicit interactions. My goal would be that maybe for any given nanoparticle system, we can have a density functional theory like tool to predict crystal structures. It may not be super practical, but it will be like doable, <laughs> right? So just the concept that you could do that, uh, I think is, is, is actually very insightful for understanding in general, where do these complex crystal structures emerge? Um, okay, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you for indulging my extra time and thank you from Ann Arbor. The particle or the smallest unit cell we can calculate with this method? The um, unit He's gotten up to 432 particle unit cell. Uh, to get that one, that, the one I showed you, he had to go to the second orbital. That was a, that was a nightmare calculation. Um, it, took a real, it took a long time. In fact, I think he had to like break it down into, into chunks and look at pieces, just pieces of this crystal structure somehow. But um, yes, I think it's not, it's, it's not necessarily a practical way of doing it, but it's more from a fundamental idea that, that the fact that you could do it and you can predict all of these crystal structures with nothing but entropy in the same way that you would if they were atoms and needed all this, the exchange correlation terms in your Hamiltonian, I think is profound. Well, here, I mean, you have these, the, the, these things are crystals, so their fractal dimension is three. It's just the dimension of the embedding space. Um, so, so, I don't, so that kind of self-similarity doesn't, I, I know, I, I know what, you're, what, you're, what you're asking, but I don't know where, those would, where that would, would come in. I mean, the way it would come in, and this is what we're studying is, if I, if I, actually did a simulation with the best potentials I could of some, some system that forms a crystal structure, and I did it with a shape, and I followed the kinetic pathways, are they the same? Are they totally different? Um, if I'm self-assembling gold atoms into a gold nanoparticle, and I could actually follow, which we can, uh, the exact kinetic pathway, and then I take these gold nanoparticles and follow their kinetic pathway, are they the same? Does it depend on the forces or does the system not care? The fact that we saw this fluid fluid phase separation for the clathrate crystals, actual clathrates have liquid liquid phase transitions prior to crystallization. So I think that's where the similarity comes in looking at the kinetic pathways. Okay, let's thank Sharon once again. Swag. Swag, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, uh, Woo.
Let's everybody uh, join us outside for the uh, reception. For the wine? Is there wine? Oh, there is wine. <laughs> <laughs>